To the ancient Egyptians, embalmers were sacred individuals tasked with making sure their loved ones were appropriately prepared to make the journey to the afterlife. They believed that their body and soul were linked and that for an individual to continue to the afterlife, they first had to be identifiable in the underworld to receive their final judgment. It was an important job that required a very strong stomach. Today we're going to take a look at a day in the life of an Egyptian embalmer. But before we get mummified, walk your mouse like an Egyptian to that subscribe button and join us on the Weird History Channel. After that, we'd be most grateful if you would leave a comment and let us know what other Egyptian historical topics you would like to hear about. Okay, it's about to get very embalmy in here. We're off to ancient Egypt. Embalming was important because it was believed to help define how a person would look when they arrived in the afterlife. Kind of like a personal trainer for eternity. When the embalming practice first began to catch on in ancient Egypt, it was reserved strictly for royalty and other members of the upper classes. Much like your local car wash, as embalming became more common, embalmers began offering different levels of service depending on the social status of the client. Whether you were a pharaoh or just an ordinary person on the street, your local embalmer had something right for you, minus the air freshener. Thanks to the testimony of the Greek historian Herodotus, we even have some idea of how the sales process worked. The embalmers would have painted wooden models that demonstrated the three different levels of service available to the family of the deceased. The first was the best and most expensive, which was believed to resemble the god Osiris. Not a bad look to have. We know the ancient Egyptians called the structure where the embalming took place the Good House, and the workshop itself the Pure Place. Historians and archaeologists had long believed that this good house was a tent or other temporary structure. It was erected near the prospective internment site, away from populated areas that might be bothered by the stench. However, an archaeological find at the Saqqara necropolis showed something slightly different. The dig uncovered an embalmer's workshop, which, as predicted, was adjacent to a communal internment site. But the structure was more permanent than had been previously imagined. Thanks once again to Herodotus, we know quite a bit about the process of embalming. Embalming would start by cleaning the body and removing the innards. Then the body would be covered in a salt called natron and left that way for 70 days. After the 70 days, the person would be washed and rolled in bands of fine linen, which were glued together with gum. It sounds pretty convincing, but archaeological discoveries and the works of other ancient writers make it clear that Herodotus left out a few steps. Similarly, a stella from the 6th century BC alludes to the process only taking 42 days, so we can assume there was some variability in how these things were done. Depending on which level of service was selected by the decedent's family, there were several ways of removing one's internal organs. The high-end procedure started with taking out the brain. They would do this using a hook and yanking it through the nose as one does when removing the brain. Next, they would remove everything in the torso, the lungs, stomach, liver, and intestines. The heart, however, which was believed to be the center of a person's soul, was left behind. The organs were then placed into jars, and the empty cavity was cleaned out with palm wine and spices, then filled with myrrh and cassia. Finally, the body was sewn back together. The mid-level procedure for those, as Herodotus said, wished to avoid great cost, was a little different. Embalmers would fill the belly using syringes of cedarwood oil. The physical being would then be left for several days for the oil to dissolve their internal organs. Finally, the oil would be drained, emptying out the body's interior. Between this and the use of natron salt on the flesh, the body would be reduced to skin and bones and then returned to the family. What a treat for them. The lowest level procedure consisted of simply cleaning out the belly and treating the skin with natron for the requisite 70 days. After that, the body was returned. While the exact process of mummifying changed over the centuries, cleaning, drying, and purifying the body always remained fundamental. Water was used to wash the anatomy, and it was mixed with natron that would eat away the skin. The solution was efficient, but not terribly healthy for the embalmers themselves, since natron was known to be hard on the lungs, eyes, and of course, skin. Natron is a naturally occurring mineral salt made from sodium carbonate. Its purpose was to dehydrate the body, though archaeology shows that embalmers would also use regular salt and sometimes even sand for this purpose. After removal of the organs, the body would be covered in natron and then placed on a table. The table would be tilted so any fluid would drain and be collected in a container. 
The process was witnessed and recorded in the first century BC by the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus. He said the embalmer would reach his hand through an incision in the thoracic cavity and remove anything except the kidneys and heart. At the same time, another embalmer would clean every single piece of viscera by rinsing it with palm wine and fragrant water. After that, the carcass would be anointed with cedar oil. Diodorus didn't record exactly how much of these substances were used, but archaeologists at Saqqara have found labeled measuring cups that give us some idea of the amounts involved. Frankincense and myrrh are famous in the nativity story, but they're also known for being among the fragrances that Egyptian embalmers would use to treat mummies. The ultimate point of the treatment, which could also utilize cinnamon, cassia, and other scented woods and fragrant oils, was to give the body a smell that would please the gods. It's also likely that the treatment made the process far more tolerable for the embalmers themselves. This part of the embalming was so important that it was repeated several times over the course of the process. The first time would be directly after the removal of the brain, when a mixture of wax, scented oil, and resin would be poured into the skull to preserve its shape. Later, the body would be massaged with juniper oil, beeswax, wine, spices, and milk. Finally, the body would be covered in oil from shoulders to feet during a ceremony known as the opening of the mouth, when the mouth would be reopened so the individual could eat in the afterlife. The condition of the mummy would determine how an individual looked in the afterlife, and it was important to be recognizable in the afterlife. Therefore, it was important that embalmers be able to ensure an embalmed person would resemble its pre-dehydrated appearance. To do this, the workers would wait until the hide was sufficiently dried out and then remove the natron. It was then cleaned and its cavities would be stuffed with sawdust, linen, and sand. Scented oils and resins might also be included in the stuffing. This was all a bit of an art form, and it wasn't always done well. For example, Queen Hanatawe of the 19th dynasty was so overstuffed her body was out of proportion and her cheeks literally burst. Similarly, those mummified could be easily damaged if not correctly handled. A set of ancient instructions cautioned workers to beware of turning the body upside down onto its abdomen or face, warning, the body is filled with medicinal materials and the gods which are within the abdomen might be displaced from their position. Thanks to Hollywood movies, the popular image of the Egyptian mummy is of a body carefully wrapped in strips of linen. According to Herodotus, the most expensive form of embalming came with such a wrapping which would be applied after the body had been drying for 70 days. The cranium and limbs were typically wrapped first and the material would be applied in layers so as to preserve the shape of the body. However, second and third tier embalmings did not include the professional wrapping. The mummy would be returned to its family after being dried and the family would have to do the wrapping themselves. Royalty was typically wrapped in high quality textiles, but the most common material used for mummy wrapping was linen. Second and third tier bodies were likely to be wrapped in their own garments or leftover household items. Mummies were often wrapped with amulets that bore sacred symbols which were associated with specific gods, like Osiris. Royal mummies were often decorated with jewels and precious metals. Once wrapped, the body would be dipped in resin, at which point paint, burial masks, and inscriptions could be added. According to Diodorus, Egyptian embalmers were all men. Because of this, different rules had to be observed when embalming women. The wives of high-ranking men and women who were considered exceptionally beautiful or of high regard would not be immediately turned over to the embalmers, but held back for three or four days. Why? Brace yourself. According to Herodotus, these women were held back longer to prevent embalmers from, say, um, mm, how do I put this, mistreating their bodies? If you get what I'm saying? If you've seen the video for Tom Petty's Last Dance with Mary Jane, you understand this. The Greek historian reported, one of the embalmers was taken once doing so to the body of a woman lately passed, and his fellow craftsmen gave information. Yeah, moving on. According to Herodotus, whenever anyone passed away in the Nile, whether they were an Egyptian or a stranger, it was the responsibility of the people of the city who found the body to lay him out in the fair's way they can and enter him in a sacred place. The town or individuals who found a person would be responsible for paying the embalming costs, and those costs were relatively minimal. Depending on the procedure selected, the cost was roughly one silver talent, which the writer called an altogether insignificant amount. 
Herodotus and Diodorus agree that embalming was a family profession passed down from father to son and that the demand for embalmers could ebb and flow depending on how popular the practice was at any given time. At their height, embalmers formed a union aimed at, among other things, protecting their trade secrets. The union created a hierarchy of workers. Supervisors, or Harry Seshta, also known as Master of Secrets, oversaw the process. They would wear jackal masks, thus taking on the role of Anubis, who in myth prepared Osiris for the afterlife. Next in the hierarchy was the Ketimu Nether, or seal bearer of the god, and the Keri Hebit, or keeper of the sacred book, who would call out appropriate sayings at proper times. Beneath them were the Wetyu, who prepared the embalming materials. Greek writers described workers who were incision makers and picklers, but so far, no Egyptian writings have identified what these roles were. Do you think you would have the stomach to be an Egyptian embalmer? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.